Hello, everyone, uh, dear comrades and friends. Welcome to today's workshop. My name is Ching Wang, who will be today's moderator. Um, this workshop is part of the GSI project, Global Studies Initiative project, um, which is specifically called Conditions of Sovereignty, um, directed by Professor Kokumen Koichiro and co-organized by East Asian Academy for New Liberal Arts, EAA, whose director, Professor Nakajima, and deputy director, Professor Ishii, are uh, also here. So first and foremost, let's invite Professor Kokubun to briefly introduce our project and its agenda. Okay, thank you. Oh, sweet. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. And uh, uh, I thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Professor Jack Lezra to, to participate this, this, this seminar. And uh, we are now using Zoom and uh, we are in the uh, Saturday morning and uh, you're in the uh, Friday, Friday night. Right? <laughs> and, uh, and as I talked earlier, it was, you must be a bit tired at the weekend and Friday night. <laughs> and so I, I, I would talk a very, very short, short one. And uh, my talk will be very short at the very opening remark. And I, I just want to present the problematic of the seminar. The, I, it will be a very short uh, explication of the, uh, the subject uh, conditions of uh, sovereignty. So opening remarks, opening remark. Um, as two decades of 21st century has passed, in the present day, with radical proceedings of globalization and informatization, the seemingly outdated concept of sovereignty has again caught people's attention. While in modernity, sovereignty has been transferred from the prince to the people, the framework of the concept has not been sufficiently problematized. Indeed, in political theories, people have pointed out the limits of this concept, yes. But when considering the very way in which nation state, the concept of nation state has been criticized from 1990s onwards, we have to concede that a critical examination of the concept of sovereignty is yet to be carried out. On the other hand, while theoretical examinations of the concept are insufficient, in reality, sovereignty has increasingly become a polemical concept. I presume. In different, in different forms, people have been worried about the possibility that decisions made under democracy may be detached, detached from the sovereign or from the sovereign power. Britain's Brexit is exemplary in this regard, while Trump, Trump phenomenon may be understood as a similar phenomenon. I think that in the problematic of sovereignty, we are still confronted with an old but persistent question. Can sovereignty govern? Is sovereignty able to govern? Here by sovereignty, I mean a political power or force based on publicly open norms of law. Historically, sovereignty has had two directions, outward direction and inward direction. The former, the outward words right to declare war freely, independently. 
and the latter, the inward right of legislation, legislation. That is a power to legislate law and impose it to people. This is why I consider the one of the essential parts of the concept of sovereignty to be public openness. Public openness is uh, the essential uh, part of, the, of this concept, sovereignty. Because law is by definition publicly open. However, however, law has a very clear limit. Publicly open power cannot do everything in terms of governance. This engenders the possibility of so-called state of exception, which can be very simply defined as a situation where political executions exceed legislative norms. Executions exceed norms. This was discussed, of course, as you know, by Carl Schmitt and the Vault of Benjamin, and is still being repeatedly problematized by, for example, Georgia Gumben and other contemporary scholars. Let me, uh, <laughs> permit me to speak a little bit of my personal experiences. I spent, I myself have spent some of my scholar energy on the problem of this executive power in the political regime called democracy, uh, political, um, executive power and democracy is one of my very important uh, subject, subject. People, especially in Japan, can do almost nothing about policies implemented by executive powers, for example, state government and local government. I once wrote a book on my experience as an activist when I was engaged in a local movement that was organized against a road construction in my neighborhood. During this movement, I really noticed that in spite of the fact that our country is supposed to be democratic. And we certainly can elect representatives by voting. Policies truly essential to our political life are not decided by representatives, but by state and local governments. In spite of the fact that Oh, sorry, in spite of this, in spite of that, this political regime can be called democratic. This is a deception, but in a sense, this is not. Because the sovereignty has been defined as legislative power. If people can join the formation of this power by election. One can say that in this regime, people possess sovereignty, therefore this is democratic. So this is a deception and not a deception, it's a, it's a problem. So thank you for listening my, to my personal experience. In this experience, I encountered the problem of state of exception in a very small problem, it's a very short road, but it, it's a very strong, big, big problem to in, in your neighborhood. So I encountered the problem of state of exception 
and the exceptionally strong power of executive power. And I confess, I confess that I felt inside myself a desire for sovereignty. I confess, I, I felt the desire for sovereignty. Because I, I felt, I really remember that we are the, we, we are the sovereign. Because people, we people are the sovereign. Why can we not decide this policy of constructing the world? My, my very honest feeling that I have. So I, but, but because I am a philosophy scholar, I know the criticisms made on the concept of sovereignty, of course. So I became perplexed, very perplexed. Inside, I felt the need or sovereignty, and uh, as a scholar, or the concept of sovereignty is uh, criticized, and I, I, I am, in a sense, convinced that so I was, I became very complex, uh, perplex. So, this is one of the reasons why I proposed as the subject of the series of seminars, concept of sovereignty. So, maybe the starting starting point is very personal, but. I think this this prob uh, this problematic is really um, important today, and uh, Mr. Wang uh, Wang San uh, agreed with uh, this project, and so and now we can open this series of a conference by inviting uh, Professor Jack Reza. It's very very honorable to, to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Kokubun. Now, today is main dish. Main dish, yes. <laughs> We're very honored to be able to invite Professor Jacques Lesra to give a talk today. Um, professor Lesra is distinguished professor of Spanish at the University of California, Riverside, and chair of the Department of Hispanic Studies. He has published a lot of books, including On the Nature of Marx Things, Untranslating Machines, um, Wild Materialism. By the way, I'm the translator of the Chinese edition of this book. And uh, unspeakable sub subjects and so forth. His recent co-edited volumes include Thinking with Bagbar, Allegory and Political Representation, and Lucretius and Modernity. Professor Lesra has edited collections on the work of Arthur, Bagbar, and Michel Ray and on Spanish republicanism and published articles on Cervantes, Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, contemporary and early modern translation theories and practices, fluid, producer, wolf, animality studies, and other topics. He is also the co-translator into English uh, of the famous dictionary of untranslatables, as well as the translator of Paul de Man's Blindness and Insight. So today he'll be talking about qualified immunity or conditional sovereignty on defective institutions. Without further ado, let me give you Jacques Lesra. <clears throat> Thank you so much. It's an honor to be participating in this wonderful seminar and series of talks and to be inaugurating them. Um, I hope to start things off by making some completely unsustainable and irresponsible assertions um, about the nature of sovereignty, which I hope we can discuss in the question and answer section of this um, presentation. I've slightly altered the title because as I was writing, I realized that if I wrote out everything I wanted to say under that first title, I would speak for three or four hours and that's hardly appropriate. So I'm speaking on instance of the police on defective institutions. Some 75 years ago, Hannah Arendt opened an essay that she would later republish in the volume Between Past and Future with this remark about her title. She says, in order to avoid misunderstanding, it might have been wiser to ask in the title, what was and not what is authority? 
For it is my contention that we are tempted and entitled to raise the question because authority has vanished from the modern world. Since we can no longer fall back upon authentic and indisputable experiences common to all, the very term has become clouded by controversy and confusion. Little about its nature appears self-evident or even comprehensible to everybody, except that the political scientists may still remember that this concept was once fundamental to political theory, or that most would agree that a constant, ever-widening and deepening crisis of authority has accompanied the development of the modern world in our century. Now, it's sovereignty and not authority that is the subject of a series of conferences and seminars that this talk inaugurates. Where the two enter into dispute, there, the police insists. The police is a symptom, a means of mapping the relation between contemporary sovereignty and contemporary authority, but also the point from which their necessity can be brought into question. Let's begin then. Today, guided by the sense that the relation between sovereignty and authority is not self-evident or even comprehensible to everybody, we're tempted and may feel entitled to ask not just what is sovereignty, but what was sovereignty. We're moved, though, by reasons different from those that Arendt offers in 1954 for asking the questions concerning authority. Indeed, there's something about Arendt's entitlement to pass from the present tense to the past, from what is authority to what was authority, that seems on its face off with regard to the term sovereignty. And perhaps this sense that we are not in the same way, if at all entitled to consign sovereignty to a historical past may help understand just what the term can mean today. For although the term sovereignty's sense too has become clouded by controversy and confusion, it is not because whatever sovereignty designated or designates has vanished from the modern world. I cast my eyes around and see that everywhere sovereign power and sovereign right are claimed and asserted. Everywhere there's a figure that will assert the right to govern a territory or to define and police the uses of a concept or the rules governing a market. The classic Westphalian forms of state, national or individual sovereignty persist along emergent forms something like a generalized, if unequal and discontinuous distribution of the right to claim sovereignty seems at work. This ranges from the judicial doctrine of the strong unitary executive propounded by conservative legal theory in the United States to claims that First Nations make to land and culture against and within modern colonial states to the forms of sovereignty arrogated to meta-national institutions like the International Court of Justice in The Hague, the World Trade Organization, the IMF, and so on, to claims offered by non-state organizations from the so-called terrorist organization uh, that might be Al-Qaeda, to corporations, including universities, which are invested with powers of legislation, value determination, legitimation, and coercion throughout the late capitalist world. Yes. Whatever sovereignty is today, it is not what it was in the line that leads from Hobbes to Schmidt and Kantorovich. That this distributed sovereignty is other than it was, however, in no way diminishes the force of its claims. Neither does the difference between that's that what sovereignty was and what sovereignty is, neither does this difference authorize us to assign our claims about sovereignty today any greater or lesser value than they once had, explanatory or descriptive or normative. This isn't to say that our claims in this regard have no force, just that their force cannot be founded on that difference as it is in the case of authority. In 1954, Arendt takes the dispersal and confusion of senses of the term authority as evidence of the effective absence of authority itself. Absent authentic and indisputable experiences common to all, the authority of the term authority is shaken. Some four years later, she delivers a lecture on freedom and politics in which Arendt strikingly argues that, quote, under human conditions which are determined by the fact that not man but men live on the earth, freedom and sovereignty are so little identical that they cannot exist simultaneously. The lecture, 
revised and supplemented, makes its way into between past and future, where it follows the chapter on what is authority that I've just been citing. Arendt does not alter her claim in revised freedom and politics. In both the lecture and in the chapter, now called What is Freedom, she continues, where men wish to be sovereign as individuals or as organized groups, they must submit to the oppression of the will, be this the individual will with which I force myself or the general will of an organized group. If men wish to be free, it is precisely sovereignty they must renounce. Sovereignty is then a different matter from authority, and it has not in 1954, not in 1960, and not today, vanished as authority has, or has been renounced in favor of freedom. My sense of things differs from Arendt's in two ways. I'm not confident that the same frame can be used where the individual will with which I force myself is concerned, and where the general will of an organized group is concerned. Sovereignty is not the same in one and the other domain, and the analogy, even the synonymy with which Arendt treats the two, although it expresses something of the critical view of an age in which the psychoanalysis of culture was on the ascendant, is fragile. Then too, I am not certain that sovereignty is the sort of thing that vanishes or can be renounced. We'll find hints of these positions, the position that sovereignty only muddily and ephemerally covers the oppression of both the individual and the general will, the position that sovereignty does not vanish historically, and the position that sovereignty is not the sort of thing that men can renounce as a monarch would renounce his or her crown, we find hints of these positions in Arendt's own formula, if men wish to be free, it is precisely sovereignty they must renounce. Am I free to renounce sovereignty? What sort of act of will is renouncing? Men, in the phrase, if men wish to be free, must mean singular men, specific men, or that man, and not generic man, the collective species, as the alternate translation of Arendt's lecture, published in 1961, puts it. But Arendt's must expresses more than the desire that this or that man should renounce sovereignty, his crown, his position and power. It submits the general term men to the command, you must renounce if you will be free. Am I, this or that man, then free not to renounce sovereignty? Am I free not to be addressed or interpolated by Arendt's normative call or interpolation? Not if I am to belong to the class of men of whom freedom is the definitive political foundation. What is perhaps the most famous renunciation scene in literature, King Richard II's self-deposition in Shakespeare's play hangs its discomfort on the question, can I renounce what I is or am? What sort of performative act, felicitously grounded in what sovereign authority am I carrying out when I undo myself? And when I say with Richard, I resign to thee, I will undo myself. I give this heavy weight from off my head and this unwieldy scepter from my hand. To whom or to what do I resign sovereignty? Deposing myself, I pose myself as a naked immediate subject in both senses of the term subject. Even this is wrong though. Nothing about my experience of subjection is immediate or naked. Here, as you listen to me, you remark that I am operating by analogy, if not by synonymy. Richard's experience is sufficiently like my own and sufficiently like a general experience of sovereign resignation that it can stand in for mine and others. On these grounds, on grounds of analogy, even synonymy, I have invested my argument with the authority of the culturally sanctioned citation. You see me bathing my speech in light that's useful to me, plunging ad fontes, ab auctoritate, to authority, because Shakespeare, that sovereign value, that figure whose work offers authentic and indisputable experience, 
that should be common to all in as much as it's been used by classes invested in the designation to name what is indeed culturally common to all because Shakespeare offers perhaps the most famous index in elite Western culture of renunciation and deposition. To renounce is to abdicate to someone on the foundation of an authority outside of me at another's command. You must, whether it's uttered by Henry Bolingbroke or Hannah Arendt. I'm offering you as mine, King Richard II's words in Shakespeare's line renouncing my claim to my words and to my argument, but also taking for my purpose from Shakespeare, the figure to whom I've abdicated his cultural authority. In this, I follow Richard himself, who dons Christ's figure momentarily. Richard's analogy is sanctioned by the long tradition asserting the divine right of kings, the synonymy between the sovereign and God. He says, I well remember the favors of these men. Were they not mine? Did they not sometimes cry, all hail to me? So Judas did to Christ, but he in 12 found truth in all but one. I in 12,000, none. My objection, my subjection, my sublime subjectivity. To imagine that I can renounce sovereignty is to imagine that I can freely refuse the address the interpolation of Arendt's commanding must, and that I can address you shorn of analogy and synonymy, shorn of another's cultural authority. It's to imagine that my abjection becomes by wandering and slow steps, subjection, and then subjectivity. It's to imagine that I can first cut myself off from analogies or synonymies, which may supervene even when I don't command them, when they're not at my hand and my command, and then, patient, suffer these analogies and synonymies to invest me with the sovereign freedom to act. To imagine this is to seek a model of invulnerable, pristine and deciding political subjectivity, self-deposing and self-founding as Richard is both self-deposing and self-founding when he hyperbolically claims for himself, suffering even beyond Christ's. He says, he in 12 found truth in all but one, I, in 12,000, none. So he's 12,000 times better than Christ or suffers 12,000 times more than Christ or even more because it's the relation between zero and one. To imagine that I can renounce sovereignty is to imagine and to seek to found in the abject gesture of self undoing a subjectivity untouched by the constraints of disciplines, institutions and other worlds untouched, unthreatened, but also rendered useless or unintelligible inasmuch as it is unmoored from the felicity conditions produced by constraining disciplines, institutions, and worlds of speech. Neither the authority on which I stand in order to depose myself, nor the other to whom I deliver my sovereignty in order to receive in the return my naked subjectivity and subjection, neither of these is given or in my hand or present to me, or even intelligible to me. To understand the abject gesture of unmooring and mooring myself to what is like, to understand this unfounding foundation, you will want to know what follows from insisting on the irreducibility of sovereignty and on its complicity, pace aren't with authority. You'll wonder at the specifically masochistic disposition that I'm setting on offer in the figure of Richard. You'll wish to know whether it's true that constraint, even the police, provides felicity conditions for my speech. Whether my subjection is indeed the condition of my subjectivity, the condition on which I can arrogate to myself the subject's sovereign power to answer to a demand, even the demand to undo himself. You'll ask me in what order of speech or description, at what level of analysis I am claiming that this irreducibility operates. Am I, who I, not catching myself in Arendt's trap, doesn't sovereignty so designated lead, in her words, either to a denial of human freedom, if it is realized that whatever men may be, they are never sovereign, 
or to the insight that the freedom of one man or a group or a body politic can be purchased only at the price of the freedom, that is, of the sovereignty of all others. I take it that for Arendt, the path into this dilemma cannot be avoided whenever freedom and sovereignty are made synonymous, i.e., and together foundational for political subjectivity, as in the Roussonian tradition that Arendt analyzes. But this is not the only conception of sovereignty or political subjectivity at hand. We find others precisely where the assertion of analogy or synonymy, the IE, that is, id est, das heist, where the mooring of different terms to the same substance or concept becomes explicitly a political value. Right? That's going to be an unfolding that thesis is going to be what the rest of my talk will be about. Let me underscore four differences between sovereignty or sovereign power and the concept of authority and claims that rest upon it. I'll list them in increasing order of controversiality. In the first place, authority cannot stand upon persuasion or coercion, Arendt points out, but sovereignty and its claims are indissociable from coercion. In the second place, that authority is founded in authentic and indisputable experiences common to all, entitles Arendt and her readers to ask after its absence. The authority of such experiences is the title on which the question of authority is posed, that these experiences persist or can be revived or evoked, and that their authenticity remain un remains unchallenged simply is authority for Arendt. Claims to sovereignty or sovereign power, however, are not and were never founded in this way. This is not a historical, but a structural and conceptual matter. Authority and sovereignty have different and incompatible relations to foundation. A figure, a monarch, the church, an institution like the family or the university may possess or have possessed authority founded in authentic and indisputable experiences common to all. But it is or was sovereign because it produces and polices the quality of common to allness that makes it possible to assert that this is like that in respect to a third term, or that this is that, synonymy and analogy. That my argument is like the lines that Shakespeare gives to Richard in this or that way, that Richard's experience is like Christ's, and so on, these are all effects of sovereignty rather than of authority. In the third place, Sovereignty is not, not only is not founded in the recollection or the assertion of a moment in which there were authentic and undisputable experiences common to all, sovereignty is not founded in experiences at all. The sovereign claim founds experience, including the experience that authority was and is no longer. In the fourth and final place, please note that a great deal of what I'm proposing hangs on how we understand the power to produce and to police consensus, or what is indisputably common to all, what Gramsci and others in his wake have called hegemony. Experiences that are common to all are indisputable because disputing them places one outside what is and who is common. If I dispute the common understanding of these experiences, I am no longer one of many men, a man in relation to other men, part of the collective species. Hence, the police. The police are the institution that the modern state charges, whether explicitly or implicitly, with regulating consensus and with rendering its sovereignty indisputable. Hence, the efforts that modern states make to invest the police with authority, to make of them an institution commonly understood to be founded in what is common to all, an institution commonly understood to be founded in a normative pre-social idea of the good, common good or the common weal. The police is authoritative and authorized when it is not understood as an institution device compounded of devices for producing, normalizing, and administering the experience of commonality and of determining not just what may or may not, but what can and what cannot be experienced as common. Right. So let me repeat that. The police is authoritative and authorized when it is not understood as an institution device compounded of devices 
for producing, normalizing, and administering the experience of commonality and of determining not just what may or may not, but what can and what cannot be experienced as common. The devices at hand for this institution device that we call the police are all the technology that comprises the surveillance apparatus, the palette of coercive instruments ranging from the hand or the knee as in Eric Garner and George Floyd's cases in the United States, to the club, the taser, and the gun. The police is authoritative and authorized when and because it is invested with what jurisprudence in the United States has called qualified immunity from prosecution. The explicit legal formulation of such immunity, for instance, in cases built on the precedent of the 1965 Pearson v. Ray decision, this explicit legal formulation is secondary to the implicit formula of immunity, to the implicit immunization that the sovereign always employs when authorizing device institutions to produce and police as common the experience of its foundation. The police is authoritative and authorized when that other set of institutions, the school, the culture industry, have erased from you its function as the instrument device for producing and regulating consensus. This is all, I would say, clear enough today. We live it every day, on screen, in the street, interpolated, called out, under the power of coercion. Is there an alternative? Is there a way of imagining institutions in general, the police, the university, the family, Institutions that don't only or tendentially serve the sovereign claim, that is, that are not only or tendentially dispositive technical devices and don't only or tendentially produce and police hegemony. Can we imagine institutions which, if they tend toward producing and policing, also produce, guard, and administer non-hegemonizing, non-common, disputable experiences. We will call such institutions defective. Their authority will be in perpetual and open conflict with their explicitly sovereign function. The likenesses, identities, and commonalities that these institutions found or evoke will be profoundly and structurally disputable. Their borders, in consequence, are to be crossed and recrossed, drawn and redrawn and erased. The regime that these defective institutions compose, we will call a republic. Let's work off of the classic definition of the police in the modern state. Right? It is the institution by means of which the state retains and administers, with regards to the subjects comprising it, a monopoly of violence. I'm lifting this standard definition from Max Weber's essay, Politics as Vocation, which I'll return to in brief. In this definition, the phrase, with regard to the subjects comprising it, does the following work. It draws a distinction between the military and the police, as be between institutions with different objects, one external, the military, the other internal, the police. Of course, today, in the United States and increasingly in other countries, the line between the police and the military is crossed and blurred by the flow of arms and personnel and by the migration of techniques, language, and goals between the two institutions. Remark what this crossing and blurring of bounds between the institutions also obscures. It obscures what and who lies within or without the state just who and what will be subject to its purchase, to its laws, to its violence. Remark as well that this obscuring, crossing, and blurring, which occurs on what appeared to be a political level, enables and is enabled by globalizing capital's various erasings and effacements and transvaluations on the economic level of spatial distinctions broadly, as these concern the circuits of extraction, manufacture, distribution, and consumption of goods. The police, classically understood, would be the means or this advice, the dispositive, the legitimate means by which the state enforces its monopoly of violence. Yes, but it's something more still. Let me set next to Max Weber's 
uh, account that I've just read to you, this summary that's found in August Vollmer's 1936 book, The Police and Modern Society. Vollmer, who serves in the literature on the history and sociology of policing as the imaginary founder of modern policing in the United States, represents the police and modern society as is what he says is the fruit of an earnest desire to understand the human spirit in its waywardness and of a lifelong study of certain problems of human behavior. His goal in the book in 1936 is to correct the overwhelmingly indifferent negative attitude of the public punctuated by spasms of short-lived ineffectual indignation that in no small degree nullify the effectiveness of police and other restrictive governmental authority. For, Volmer says, public opinion in this country with respect to the police and to the fundamental indispens indispensable quality of their functions in any state of society that hopes to endure is almost disastrously ignorant. And he concludes with these lines. Friction between classes and between races and between those of differing political, social, or religious beliefs seems to be a universal law. As long as this is true, there will be need for police to preserve order, protect lives and property, and finally, to preserve the integrity of the state and nation. Whatever else may be said of the American police, this fact should be more widely known, namely that without the police and the police organizations, with all their many defects, anarchy would be rife in this country and the civilization now existing on this hemisphere would perish. The American police are justified if for no other reason than because it is in, in their hands rests in large measure the preservation of the nation. Uniquely, then, the existence of the police raises the question that Vollmer deals settle, the question whether without the police anarchy would be rife in this country and that the American police are justified because in their hands rests the preservation of the nation. This is a question that for Vollmer is settled, but Weber poses it explicitly as a question in politics as vocation. The question is, is the state to exist? This is the way Weber famously poses the question. Like the political institutions historically preceding it, the state is a relation of men dominating men, a relation supported by means of legitimate, i.e., considered to be legitimate violence, right? I want to stress that. I'm going to return to that little phrase. If the state is to exist, the dominated must obey the authority claimed by the powers that be. When and why do men obey? Upon what inner justifications and upon what external means does this domination rest? We may want to weaken or slightly modify the question that is posed by the existence of the police a bit and ask instead whether, when, when the state is understood to be a relation of humans dominating humans, when the state is understood to be a relation supported by means of legitimate, that is, i.e., in German, das heißt, considered to be legitimate violence, whether such a state is to exist. The existence of the police opens the question of the necessity of the existence of the state. When and why do men obey the police? Weber, in one key, and Vollmer, in another key, offer a circle. The police borrows its institutional authority from the authority of the sovereign state, and the state uses the police as a means of self-authorization for the legitimation of its monopoly on violence. The circle formed by this borrowing and using is definitive of the modern conception of both state sovereignty and police authority. I'm going to call the closure of this circle, not the institution of the police, but the instance of the police. This closure is what we desire. We desire it in as much as it opens the wandering path from our abjection to our sovereign subjectivity. To take the instance of the police as our object means to address the procedures of legitimation by means of which the institution of the police acquires for some legitimacy as agent or means of realization of the state 
and the state acquires for all subjects as such legitimacy as the bearer of the monopoly of violence. These procedures of correlative legitimation involve independent institutions, the school, the university, the family, the church, the usual lot. It involves the devices for creating consensus in the society and specifically for the collectivization and regulation of memory and of aspiration. That is the collectivization and regulation of temporality in the schools, in jurisprudence, and the creation of consensus that this or that has always been so and thus, inasmuch as it represents collective wisdom and collective history, and thus that it deserves obedience and has legitimacy, that it is authoritative, and that this or that is to be aspired to because it will be the enactment of that collective wisdom and collective history. The instance of the police has the singular function of creating hegemony, that is, of setting the borders for what is indisputably common to all, in Arendt's words. It serves to regulate analogy and synonymy. It founds what's to count as a concept and as an institution in sovereign states. What do I mean then when I assert that the instance of the police is necessary? I'm not asserting that the institution of the police is necessary. Quite the contrary. Set aside necessity understood as providential necessity or logical discursive necessity, analytic necessity, strict implicature, entailment, correlation. These are analytic and logical discursive necessities. Instead, imagine that the modern state develops as an accident of historical events that could have eventuated otherwise. Now, the instance of the police is other and more than the means by which the state maintains it has maintained its monopoly over violence. The instance of the police now represents the irreducibility of necessity in the field of politics or of the necessity of necessity in the field of politics. In Max Weber, this second order function of the police, what I've been calling the instance of the police, is at work when what is legitimate is made synonymous necessarily with what is considered to be legitimate, right? This, we saw that in the section that I cited. The transition from what is to what is considered to be, what is commonly understood as, the transition to what is as legitim angesehen, that is, das heist, this is the expression for synonymy in Weber, das heist, that means, uh, that is, das heist, the transition to what is commonly and indubitably viewed as legitimate. What is legitimate is not just like or analogous to what is seen to be legitimate, it is wrought by the instance of the police the same. The instance of the police is the production of the synonymy between legitimacy and what is perceived to be legitimate. So let me unfold to close what sort of political subjectivity the instance of the police, which is the figure representing the necessity of necessity in the field of politics, makes available, why it might be that it's desired, why it might be that it's obeyed, and what an alternative to it might be. I have in mind a little bit of theater. The moment when the individual on the street is hailed and feeling herself or himself interpolated, turns around for some reason. This scene, as is well known, as is commonly understood, is to be found in Althusser's 1970 essay, Ideology and Ideological State Apparatuses. What it means to hail and to be hailed have different values today than in 1970, the sense of the call, the experience it entails, the world that the call sets in place, all of these depend on factors that are too often viewed as incidental, like the location of our little scene, the race of its actors, their class, and so on. The scene of interpolation was never innocent, and certainly not so when and where Althusser is writing in 1970 and before. In the United States today, since the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement, the scene of interpolation is the sign of the worst. Now, the version of the ISA's essay that is known most commonly in English is the one published in Lenin and Philosophy. 
A longer treatment is to be found in the set of essays published in 1995 uh, sur la reproduction in French, uh, which Althusser wrote as the draft for ideology and ideological state apparatuses. I'm going to focus on a section omitted from the essay published in Lenin and Philosophy. The lines now in French, and I'll read you the translation in English in just a second, the lines go, à moins que tout le monde ait effectivement quelque chose à se reprocher sans arrêt, donc que tout le monde ressente confusément qu'il a au moins et à tout instant des comptes à rendre, c'est-à-dire des déboires à respecter, ne fût-ce que celui de répondre à toute interpellation. Étrange. All right, this is a little section that comes right at the end when Althusser is asking himself, well, why would it be that people turn around in the street when they're called by the police? Goshkorian's uh, recent translation, although it allows the strangest points of the phrase to slip by, is going to be helpful. Let me read it to you. He elides a hesitation or redu reduplication surrounding just what it is that the interpolated subject confusedly feels. This is his translation of the French lines that I just read you. This is a strange phenomenon after all, he writes one that cannot be explained by guilt feelings alone, despite the large numbers of people with something on their consciences? Or is it that everyone always has something on his conscience and that everyone confusedly feels at least that he always has accounts to render or obligations to respect, if only the obligation to respond to every hailing? Strange. A more literal translation of the same lines goes, not or is it that everyone always has something but this, Unless, that is, everyone has, in fact, something to blame him or herself for incessantly, sans arrêt, without arrest, without warrant, incessantly, sans arrêt. And thus, that everyone feels confusedly that at the very least and in every instance, he has an account to give. That is, c'est-à-dire, that is, duties to respect, even if only the duty to answer to every interpolation. Strange. Now, why would Althusser have cut these sentences? Why does Goshgarian get them wrong just here? Yes, they're more discursive, they're more informal than much of the balance of the essay. But I'd suggest that Althusser cuts them and Goshgarian mistranslates them, not for stylistic reasons, but because they open a particularly dangerous way into the question of the irreducibility of the necessity of necessity in the field of politics and also open onto alternative subjectivities and subject formations that Althusser seems to be offering directly. Take on one side, the feeling of guilt that provokes one to answer or to turn around or to call back, so yeah, are you talking to me when one is hailed? The uncomfortable feeling that one has an account to give. And you take on the other side, the feeling or the sense that the interpolation might evoke that one has duties to respect, even if only the duty to answer to every interpolation. Are these two the same? Here, the expression for synonymy in Althusser's writing is the figure of internal translation, Althusser's set à dire, the same as Weber's das heist. That is to say, that is to say. Set à dire here does the work of rendering synonymous subjectivity understood as rendering account of oneself and one's actions, and subjectivity understood as responsibility to duty. These two line up with two different classical models of subject formation. On one side, the subject is understood as the aggregate of experiences for which an account can be given, and experiences which can one can designate and more or less count. On this hand, then, an empirical even an empiricist account of subject formation. On this side, I recall. I am the subject that recalls events for which I stand to account, incidents in my life, moments, specific engagements. That's my subjectivity. Now, on the other side stands the empty formal constitution of the transcendental ethical subject. It is empty. That is, it's possessed of no specific historical or empirical content. On this side, 
my subjectivity is the empty event of my response to an interpolation, a transcendental response, what Levinas would call an anti-predicative response to the interpolation of the other. What does it mean then that Althusser's police theater renders these two synonymous? C'est à dire, every event in my life, inasmuch as I can designate it as an event in my life, must, under this description, become also an event for which I can be transcendentally responsible, formally, abstractly, and emptily. When the police interpolate me, I turn around, not only because I feel myself concretely being called to, but because by turning around, I constitute my subjectivity as the point of suture between these two subjectivizations. Every event in my life is henceforth part of a list, not just ordinally, but also indexically. It's an event with a proper name for and to which I'm responsible. Now, that conjunction, that suture term, that synonymy that Althusser is offering us in this eliminated excised section of Sur la Reproduction expresses what the instance of the police does as it expresses the necessity of necessity in the fields of politics. The instance of the police produces the synonymy of these two models of, su of subjectivization. Then by the tendential closure of all institutions in general, we now understand tendentially closed institutions moor me to what is like me. They suture the subject in two synonymized aspects as empirically constituted by denumerable experiences, empirical, and as formally responsible for every experience in the abstract or transcendental. I opened suggesting that other models of political subjectivity and other models of institution can be found where the synonymies that the instance of the police installs fail. These subjectivities moor and unfound. They are instituted in the disjoining of my empirical experience for my formal responsibility for its event. As instituted, as institutions, as defective institutions, their sovereignty is always radically divisible and their authority unfounded. Defective institutions mark the end of the hegemony of the tendentially unitary state form and of its synonyms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor, for your wonderful and a very productive talk. Uh, so before opening up discussion, let me take advantage of my role as the moderator of today's workshop and uh, um, uh, ask a very naive and a simple question. <clears throat> so it uh, seems to me that your discussion of the so-called instance of the police reminds me of uh, Walter Benjamin's discussion of the distinction or indistinction between law-making violence and law-preserving violence. And uh, uh, what I want to say is that you first discussed uh, the instance of police, of the police where the so-called uh, borrowing and uh, making or producing uh, uh, authority becomes the same uh, insofar as sovereign power is operative. Then you discussed through a reading of Althusser uh, the way in which, uh, as you put it here, uh, the, 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 the instance of the police produces the synonymy of these two models of subjectivization um, it seems to me that it's in interesting when you um, we see that the the reading of Althusser's uh, so-called interpretation of subjectivity is not an example of or about the instance of the police. Rather, it is it is. I, I will not say it's a result of the instance of the police, but rather it is kind of, it's simply, it is entailed by the 
instance of the police. It is what the instance of the police is about. The, 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 there is no kind of kind of chronological order between the two. Yeah. Like you first have the instance of the police, then you have the suture of the two organizations. No, um, they are they they are kind of uh, they are another exemplary case showing how the instance of the police functions. Right. My my question is something like this. You showed us how the instance of the police functions or operates. But of course, your discussion per se is not, it is not as a discussion, as a reading, it is not a way in which the instance of the police functions, right? Otherwise it would be disastrous. So it seems that your discussion is a representation of how the instance of the police functions, if it is still operative in the present day. Uh, I'm leading to what you call the defective institution. It seems to me that one important element, um, at least for me, to imagine how a, a, an alternative, how the so-called defective institution would be possible has to do with um, uh, a, a kind of a way to halt the the function of the instant of the police. And uh, that way of halting it, stopping it, to making it inoperative, that very way in itself is not so much political or institutional as literary or philosophical. Uh, I don't know if my reading is correct, but I, uh, my question to, to, to make a long story short is how do you make of the function, if, if that's the correct word, of philosophy, philosophical thinking, um, literary creation, um, academic writing? I mean, everything that is at once institutionalized and uh, institutionally speaking, contingent, self-destroying, self-kind of stultifying, how these elements contribute to the, the imagination or the kind of modeling of what you call a defective institution. Is that clear? <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's clear. It's, it's a very difficult question, of course. Um, but I think I have I have two ways of, of approaching it. Um, I think you're entirely right that between what I was calling the instance of the police, which I was also calling the second order function of the police, and the institution of the police, which is the person on the street who calls and hails, right? Uh, that between those two, the 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 important thing is, or unimportant thing is the chronology. It's not as though the the instance precedes the institution, um, but it doesn't work the other way either. Uh, Althusser is very clear in the essay that uh, the, that there's a kind of simultaneity to the, the the authority of the police and the call and the the, the turning around the, the subject the subjectivization. He, he refers to it, and he doesn't explore the temporality of that, but I think the, temp the temporal structure of that arrangement is cru crucial. Um, in this way, in the paper, I refer to the hegemonizing principle of, as the collectivization of memory and the collectivization of temporality. Um, so one of the issues in determining the relative priority of instance over institution or institution over instance is to think of in what temporal scheme and according to what collectivized notion of time and cause that is occurring, right? And if I'm right, we hit a kind of regress there because to determine what kind of time and causal structure 
is definitive of the relation between instance and institution. We need to have a theory of institution and instance that makes up the experience of temporality that mm -hmm. is the key to understanding the relation between instance and institution. Right. Now, what is the nature of that particular right. circle? Right. Um, it's certainly not simultaneity. And this leads me to my uh, to, to answer it in the, the, the second way. Take the example of Richard II mm -hmm. uh, and my mm -hmm. use of that quotation. So when I use the quotation, the, the, the little piece of theater that I was telling was Jacques is making an argument in order to authorize his argument. He uses a reference to Shakespeare, whose authority is established and from which he can then borrow the authority for his argument. He abdicates his authority to Shakespeare, but borrows back from Shakespeare the authority that the culture has conferred upon Shakespeare. Right. So this would be what you might call an absolutely intentional uh, right. figure of my uh, self-authorization. But never is it possible for me to know to whom I'm uh, uh, deposing myself and to whom I'm renouncing my authority. And never is it possible for me to know what I'm getting back from that. Um, and when I say never is it possible, what I mean is that the relation that I have to the authorizing value of Shakespeare is not transparent to me. It's not uh, given. Uh, it's it, the rules of my borrowing and my, my um, self uh, and my self-abdication are not uh, given or established. Rather, they, they, we enter into a world of overdetermination, contingency, and the aleatory construction, which means that I, since I don't know what I'm borrowing back and I don't know what I'm giving up or to whom I'm giving it up, it's not possible for me to construct a model of subjectivity that's, that's invulnerable or a model of responsibility mm -hmm. to uh, an entity to which I'm delivering my sovereign power, right? So if you put these two things together, that kind of strange um, infinite regress uh, eventuating in a circularity on the side of temporality, and on the other side, the the kind of uh, overdetermination of the authority of the, the figure to which I grant my abdication and from which I take authority for my subjectivization and response. If you put them together, you get a way of approaching Benjamin and a, a way of approaching the problem of the relation between instance and institution that insists on the determination and the temporal uh, opacity and the opacity of the temporality of the relation between instance and institution um, as well. So that's, I think, what that, that you know, it, if, if one were to unfold my paper totally, that argument would have to be made uh, clearer. And I thank you very much for allowing me to, to try to make it a little bit clearer. Thank you. Thank you. It's very clear. Um, okay. Now, um, I guess Professor Kokubun must have some comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. It's a very inspiring text and um, it forced me to think so many things. Um, um, firstly, a very simple uh, question. I really want, uh, interested in what to call defective institutions. And uh, I, yes. I do want some more explanations and um, yeah, some more explanations. <laughs> what what, what okay. do you imagine by by these terms, and um, and uh, before okay. that, <laughs> yes. And before that, I just this comment. And uh, I'm so inspired by the Deleuzean philosophy, and uh, the early Deleuze uh, sometimes mentioned the distinction between law and the institution, right? as you know. And uh, law is what bans; institution is what offers uh, models for for conducting. And, um, Law is very negative, and then institution is positive. And uh, I, I was 
I was thinking about the possibility of supervening your your scheme and the due diligence scheme. And, and, you know, maybe, maybe so, if I follow the due diligence schema, and um, this institution can be uh, distinguished into defective one and um, authoritative and also lies to one. And, uh, I, I don't know. I, 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 maybe I would complicate this. Uh, those young, uh, very simple. Uh, oh, that, yeah, that's very. And I'm. That's very helpful. Let me. So let, let me first say that, the. The, the paper that I've just offered you is part of a, will be part of a much longer book on defective institutions, right? And, I'm hoping to have that book finished soon. So I should be able to offer you a, a very cogent and clear uh, definition of what effective is, defective institutions are. <laughs> we'll see if that's possible. But the other thing to say is that I, I take Deleuze as one of my points of reference in the book, the early Deleuze, the Hume, the Hume book, and also the book on, uh, on coldness and cruelty, both are about institutions. Uh, and the, the reference to masochism in, in this paper is a covert um, reference to coldness and cruelty and to the to the masochistic contract and the, that form of institution uh, as well. So let me give you a sense of what I mean by a defective institution. Um, and it, it perhaps would make sense for me to define what a non-defective institution would be first and then to, to, to suggest why, why, why the defect is of importance. So my, my sense is that the word institution, although it's been used a great deal in anthropology and philosophy and psychoanalysis and phenomenology in particular, uh, is, is generally coded positive in political philosophy as the dispositive of a state that allows for the administration of um, uh, the administration of different goals and rights and, and, and resources. Um, a family is an institution in the sense that it is the set of devices that regulates uh, reproduction and the transmission of property under certain conditions. Um, my feeling is that there has been a, a kind of co-dependence that has not been recognized as clearly as it should between some of the classical figures of, uh, of the logic of identity and the concept of institution. By the logic, the, the classical figures of the logic of identity, I mean that the notion of institution is born alongside with, helps to reinforce and depends upon the principle of identity, principle of non-contradiction, principle of sufficient reason, the, the, the fundamental building blocks of philosophical logic as they're developed in the Aristotelian tradition up to uh, the, the 1920s and 30s. That the Western conception of institution and the Western conception of uh, logical identity are simultaneous and coterminous, almost. So my, my purpose in thinking of defective institutions is to try to understand what it would mean to have political institutions that don't rely on the principle of identity, the principle of non-contradiction, the principle of continuity, and the principle of reason. Uh, for, for example, um, they, what characteristics would they have politically? What would they allow us to do, these defective institutions? They're defective in as much as they're not closed. They're not, they're not coherent. They don't have the coherence of the kind of logical form that we expect because of the co-development of um, the, the, the logic of identity and the logic of institutions. So what defective institutions are then are assemblages of, I'm going to switch registers, assemblages of language games in which um, identity claims are not coherent or consistent. Mm. Uh, which do, do not have continuity, 
um, or have the sufficient continuity to achieve the, the, the goals of uh, particular moments, but no more than that. Um, defective institutions, and think of this as a family. A family then would be the an aggregate of non-identities expressing desires and wills at a certain moment, not for continuity, but for the but but for the moment, but and or but for a a set of moments, but certainly not with the goal that classical institutions have, which is repeatability and accountability over time. Rather, to go back to, to the answer to Chin's question, defective institutions install plural temporalities, what Morfino calls plural temporalities, in the structure of the concept of institution. Divergent, contradictory, contingent temporalities, divergent, contradictory, and contingent identities, and all of this in order to produce greater democracy. So if, if the, the ultimate goal is a republic in which the, uh, the, uh, the combination of defective institutions serves a democratic project because it militates against the persistence and the substantialization of institutions under the rubric of logical identity. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I think I, I, I understood your, your, your concept. So may, maybe by using the term defective institution, you do not imagine the finished vision of a republic, but uh, some parts of uh, it function as defective uh, institutions, which, which, which are among them in a sense, uh, contradictory, but they yes. function with with, uh, with function with this conflict and uh, yes, uh, yes, yes. So w one of the things to one of the things to be to be careful of that I try to be careful of is this: the doctrine of the central conflict um, is a unifying and formalizing doctrine. So what we what we're looking for in producing this model of the republic is not a single model of conflict amongst equal uh, institutions, but rather divergent figures of conflict um, operating amongst objects that may not be recognizable on the same level. Right? So it's a much more dynamic, but also much less thinkable uh, structure. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Very, um... Okay, uh, let's open up our discussion. Uh, I say that if you have questions or comments, please turn on your camera and directly jump in. Yes, Professor Nakajima. Yeah, and thank you so much for your very subtle, uh, nuanced presentation. I am not confident if I can understand the uh, important point of your presentation, but um, I try to um, ask a question to you. Um, the instance of the police seems to me has at least two different meanings. One is the uh, you know <clears throat> first uh, instance, first uh, instance of the court, second yeah. instance of the court, <laughs> such a, such uh, you know hierarchical dimension and uh, there is another uh, meaning instantness <clears throat> that is a uh, uh, no <clears throat> no you know du durating time rapid uh, identification that leads to <clears throat> the uh, questioning on set idea das heist that is right yeah <clears throat> in in, in this, you know, two different meanings of the instance of the police, I think you are trying to make some um, <clears throat> make some uh, inter penetration <clears throat> into the uh, sovereignty, right? 
So mm -hmm. instantness is never, you know, completed, even f even if we talk about setadil, das heist, <laughs> that is there. There is a uh, some mom moment that uh, <clears throat> how to say that makes some distance in mm -hmm. time and space, right? So yes. that, that, that is a, a kind of condition or a, that is a, a condition of possibility or impossibility of the police and the sovereignty, yes. right? So if my understanding is correct, I'd like to ask you the meaning of conditional sovereignty, which you had renounced, right? So how can we think of this conditional, right? Yeah. 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 Is, is it still <clears throat> belonging to the Kantian, you know, <clears throat> framework of uh, conditions of possibilities or not? Maybe not. Yeah, it goes beyond such a Kantian framework. And yeah. you are trying to think of alternative, alternative, you know, con conditioned, you know, <clears throat> instance of the sovereignty. Very That's good, yes. Yes. Again, a very wonderful, subtle question. I, 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 I thank you for it enormously. Uh, I, th I think, so let, let me, let me add to the two definitions of instance, um, a third one, um, which is there as well, which is um, insistence. Yes. Right. So, so insistence is the figure of, of of duration. So it's it's an antithetical word, in as much as it it speaks of the instant and of instance of duration. Um, and in addition to that, of course, it does have it has that wonderful meaning that that Lacan uses for the instance, Sens de la Lettre, for instance, as the, the court of appeals uh, as well. Um, so it's a, it's a highly condensed term uh, in which you're getting, a, the, you're getting precisely the con one of the contradictions that, that I'm trying to stress, which is that the, the authority, claims to authority are claims based on the insistence or the instance or the uh, the retention of an authoritative position, not on the instant, but on the instance like this. Mm -hmm. um, so the police is a figure that in, in which a culture tries to create the suture of those three terms, the, the, the court, the instant, of interpolation of subjectivization, but also the instance of mm -hmm. insistence uh, upon which the authority of the court might depend. Right? Um, so it's it's a, it's a highly compressed and symptomatically compressed term. I, I completely agree. Um, in as much as it's con contradictory, it offers a way of thinking about the concept of condition, um, I think, right? So if, if we go back to the description that I was giving of the way in which I authorize myself by means of you know, derogating my power, but also then drawing it back from the authoritative figure of Shakespeare or whatever kind of theological transcendental figure you have. Um, you would say that I'm conditioning my subjectivity to that entity to which I surrender my sovereignty in order to get back subjectivity. Mm. And this can, there can be a contract involved. Uh, it can be explicit or implicit. It can be a structural matter, um, a logical matter as well. But as long as that circuit is analytic and and, and, and understandable, we're in the world of Kantian conditions. The world that I'm interested in promoting <laughs> is a world in which the conditions are not 
understandable or, or determinable, right? So the, there is conditioning. There is, there is, the sovereignty is conditioned, but it's not conditioned upon that relation to the, 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 the to that visible and understandable frame in into which I, I offer my sovereignty in order to get back sub subjectivity. Mm, yeah. Rather, it's conditioned by a frame, the relation to which is a relation of contingent plural temporality over determination and, uh, uh, and, and, and um, Derrida in, in an early essay called Signature Event Context speaks about the, 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 the kind of fantasy of the sat saturability of context. Saturability, yes. Yeah. So what I'm interested in is a, a conditionality which is, cannot be saturated. Mm, mm, mm. And I think that that is the way to imagine a, an alternative to the Kantian frame that you were describing so well. Yeah, thank you so much. It makes me very clear. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Yes, first Professor Chang and then Professor Ishii. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Alessia, for your wonderful uh, talk. I am interested in your, uh, uh, on page five, you mentioned this uh, so-called uh, classic uh, definition uh, of uh, so-called uh, police in the modern state. Yeah. So my, my point is that, uh, what do you mean by this, uh, you know, classic? Uh, definition. Um, I, I, I thought uh, you were talking about uh, uh, the classical definition of police as uh, uh, politeia, uh, as the part of the state. That is, of course, not it. That is not the. So you, you mentioned this in the, in the modern world. So I was thinking about uh, the, the Hegelian uh, model of uh, putting the police uh, in his uh, the philosophy of. Uh, right, uh, putting police as a kind of a civil society or understood to understand police uh, within the so-called uh, civil society uh, framework. Yeah. And in this sense, police in this modern sense, uh, police is uh, of course uh, uh, still uh, uh, within the uh, civil society uh, should not be misunderstood as in the state. But uh, uh, but in reality, police is uh, part of the state and is used as a mean to suppress uh, the civil societies uh, we know very well in the case of uh, Black Lives Matter and in the case of Hong Kong, etc. So, um, but uh, I would like to bring uh, our discussion to our the, the topic of our research group, which is on uh, sovereignty. So, uh, police, in this sense, if we take this modern or, or classic modern uh, definition, um, police uh, supposed to deal with uh, rather um, local matters, uh, such as uh, the traffic things in your local uh, municipal communities, etc. But how about these uh, things related to national security or uh, so? So, do you think? It, there is a philosophical ground for the police to uh, go beyond this, you know, police, uh, you know, idea as a civil society to handle the state matters such as national security and and so if if police should uh, uh, work with all these, you know, national. Uh, security issues. So, what what is this new definition of police? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> the when I was referring to the classic definition of the police, I I was not referring, though I have in mind, ancestrally because I've been thinking about it, the the relation between the police, the politeia, and the the and and. A, a kind of function of repression or coercion that the police then be, it, it, the, the police then seems to represent. And 
the the example that, that I in my book that I work on is um, Martha Nussbaum's reading of the Eumenides um, as a you know, this, the, as a play in which there's a transition from a pre-political kind of savage state to a state in which there is uh, the possibility of, of politics um, because of the domestication of the, of the Furies and because of their expulsion from the city. So this is, this is Nussbaum's idea is that you expel the ancient figures of violence and coercion from the city and at that, in, in that way you can create a polis. This is not what the play is about. Uh, the play is about the reinsertion of the Furies as the police force in the city. Right. So that they, they are, the, the, it's simply a translation, a conversion procedure. The, the Furies, those ancient violent earth figures become the police force, right? And, and that's where the, where the police is founded in the conversion of vengeance into policing. And so this expresses a kind of political fantasy that we have done away with the bloody, the, the bloody regime of violence. And instead we have a procedural um, arm of the state, which is the, the police. Uh, my own sense, then that installs the classic version in, uh, of the police as the arm of the state that, that protects uh, civil society and or that is intended to protect civil society um, because the goal of the state is the production of civil society and so the police is simply a means to the production of civil society and like all means eventually this is the, the Hegelian model eventually like any means it will disappear in the moment in which civil society is fully realized as identical with the state um, this seems to me patently wrong right um, and the reason that it's wrong has to do with the way in which the institution of the police, qua institution, is irreducible. It, it cannot be eliminated from the, 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 from, from the, the existing state in the process of becoming civil society. Uh, it has acquired a density, a history, a, uh, an instance in, in the sense that Professor Nakajima was, was suggesting, a kind of continuity, a coherence, and an identity that prevent it from disappearing with the appearance of, of civil society. So my argument is for creating the conditions under which the police can disappear, can be made to disappear can be exiled. That means also the conditions under which the state disappears, the classic state, the state that is dependent upon the police. So it's an anarchic uh, position in some ways, right? In the classic sense of what the anarchy would be. Um, it's, uh, it, but it's also a position that, that or, or a, an argument that doesn't have an outcome, a specific outcome in mind, right? I don't have in mind a, a civil society. I have in mind the destruction of the state and the destruction of the police and the destruction of the police state and providing the conceptual basis for the destruction of the police state. That's, that's, what's the, that's what the edge of this project is. And thank you for your clarification. Thank you. Then Professor Ishii. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, that enriched my thinking a lot. Um, yeah. Um, uh, first, um, let me talk about my background. I am a Chinese philosopher. And I am, how to say, in a sense, I divided uh, uh, into history between China and J China and Japan, yeah? A sort of the, yeah, uh, um, historical problem of a reconciliation uh, between China and Japan or 
among East Asian nations. And from this point, uh, I want, um, I have a, maybe this is a comment rather than a question. Uh, I'm curious about the uh, situation in of the, the pro, uh, police officers in the United States who are qualified immunity from prosecution. Right. Okay. Um, while I'm read, I was reading your paper, uh, what I was thinking about is the, uh, is it possible for us to imagine a kind of sovereignty which can help us make us uh, reconcile with others? Okay, so in this sense, um, how to say, in my observation, uh, the police officer who was qualified, who was qualified and immunity from prosecution uh, is deprived from the opportunity of reconciliation mm. because he or she put into a sort of state of prosecution. Okay, uh, he or she uh, was deprived a right of being prosecuted. At the same time, he got uh, he lost the opportunity to be punished, and lastly he or she was deprived of right uh, of being forgiven. Right. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm right. I think that forgiveness, uh, well, forgiveness should be, uh, how I say, next to the punished. Okay. So, um, are police officers in the United States or the police as a apparatus of the state uh, can be reconciled, reconciled or can have an opportunity to reconcile yeah. with others. And does it make sense? Yes, it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderfully provocative way to think about the, the, the situation. Mm -hmm. um, I, because normally in the United States, critiques of the doctrine of, of qualified immunity speak of this as giving the giving the the police officer something mm. not of sub, not of eliminating or, or or depriving the police officer of what you were just describing which is um, quite a wonderful way to think of it it's, it, it moves us to some degree, and I think appropriately, from what we might call the legal or juridical range into the ethical range. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's appropriate that we should make that movement because the, the police are there um, ostensibly, uh, simply on the juridical legal domain, but the justification for their existence is not legal uh, and juridical, it's ethical and political. Right, so we need to be able to make that movement, uh, and all and many of the devices that the, the culture uses to make the police's role normal and um, uh, and to and, and to render invisible its coercive um, identity. Many of those have to do with translating the figure of the police into the ethical register rather than leaving it into the legal register. So this, it's an absolutely critical um, intervention, yes. So if I, were, if I were making a counter argument to your very persuasive argument, I would say that your, your argument depends upon the idea that the victim of police violence and the police officer have equal access to a domain, a sphere in which, in a neutral sense, th they could encounter each other and in which there could be reconciliation provided in, within that frame. That's not the case, right? It, it, the, the, the judiciary is not independent of the police, um, right? So. So the, one could imagine such a neutral space. The court system in the United States is not it. 
So the possibility of reconciliation in a kind of neutral space is excluded by the structural proximity between the police and the court system mm -hmm. and by the and also by the historic way in which the the populations that the police has most committed violence against are traditionally excluded from the court system and from and from justice in the court system mm -hmm. another way to put this would be to say something like this short of short of the domain of justice right installing not not law but justice it's only in the face of justice that what can have forgiveness and reconcil reconciliation the step from the institutions of law and just and and jurisprudence in the united states and the domain of justice is not a step that can be taken it's it's absolutely blocked <laughs> for historical but also for conceptual reasons uh, and for that reason, although it's, I think this is a very strong and very interesting argument, mm -hmm. um, because the concept of the, that neutral or or open space in which difference could be openly aired in order for forgiveness and reconciliation to occur, because that space is not on offer. Um, it's 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 only an argument it's it's that doesn't mean that one shouldn't make it it's like um it's it's uh if if one could even say that it's impossible right but that doesn't mean that one doesn't advocate for the impossible mm -hmm. it's it's it that's the ethical position that one has to take absolutely. And I, I, I very much like the description that you gave. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, I, I got two questions um, from Sato Maki, whose Wi-Fi is unstable. So I will just read aloud her questions. <clears throat> two questions. First one is like this. Hegel mentions that education is the art of making men ethical. Police and the politicization is obviously um, sovereign. However, her concern is that uh, is about the very subtle way of the sovereign to uh, mildly kind of brainwash, brainwash the citizens through education. So she wonders uh, what you have on your mind with regard to the role of education, um, when you talk about the concept of sovereignty uh, in your paper. The second question is that um, your argument seems to prove strength uh, on, uh, that is to say, a uh, question. In answering Professor Nagajima's uh, question, uh, you kind of suggested that his, uh, your, your idea of common fear after identifying uh, the core, the whatness. However, uh, if you are kind of depending your argument on the kind of uh, interdependency on uh, the interdependency between, between this whatness and the contingency, that leads us back to the argument about freedom um, insofar as when we talk about sovereignty, we are not talking about uh, the sovereignty of the state, but individual freedom, uh, which she guesses is, is recursive uh, in the whole argument you are making. So the question is that who is it that is going to fundamentally secure our right of freedom uh, in a kind of anarchi anarchistic world of contingency. Or how how do you if I am if I'm to rephrase her question, how to talk about political terms like freedom, individuality, um, human rights or individual rights if there is no kind of uh, 
guarantor, which is political as well as authoritative, um, in opposition to individuals. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> again, th this will allow me to go over some of the things that were a little too compressed and perhaps incoherent in the talk. So, my on the on the first question, which is the way in which education might be and and the all of the apparatuses and institutions that go into creating what we call education their relation to sovereignty the the argument that i was making was a little simple too simple and it was that the and and and, and but at the same time quite specific the contention was that the educational apparatus and the culture industry are at the service of the erasure of the coercive function of the police institution, the institution of the police. Um, now, when I say at the service of, I seem to be implying uh, a kind of intentional structure that is, uh, the, it's, it seems to be implied that the state deliberately creates the educational apparatus in order to obfuscate or erase the coercive quality of the uh, of the, the dispositive technical arm of, of the state, which is the police. Um, and I, I think it's more complex than that. My impression is that there's much more of a, a dialectical circulation between the, 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 the kind of instancing, uh, the, the, the persistent institution of the police, um, this, the, the state, um, and and those people who are being educated. So let me give, try to give you an example of what I mean. And then I I I, I feel I'm, I'm flailing a little bit about this because I was I had in mind a fairly restricted analytic concerning this particular moment. But the question that you're asking me obliges me, I think, to think of it more broadly. And that's that's important, but it, it messes things up for me. <laughs> so anyway, the 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 specific idea I had in mind was, if we imagine <clears throat> the institution of the police as the uh, arm of the state that guarantees hegemony, and that in particular um, represents the the means of administering the monopoly of violence of the state. This is Weber's, to some extent, Weber's definition. Um, then if there's going to be the illusion of, the minimally the illusion of democracy, then that coercive function of the police has to be erased or it has to be downplayed. And that's where the educational apparatus intervenes. Now in fascist states like the one that I grew up in in Spain under Franco, there was no effort to obfuscate the coercive power of the police or the hegemonizing uh, function of the police. There was no need to because it was self-evident that, that the state existed by virtue of coercion. But in contemporary liberal democracies, so-called, there the 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 function of the police, the coercive function of the police has to be masked and masqueraded. And at that point, the culture industry and the, the educational apparatus intervene to perform that masking of the coercive function of the institution of the police. That was the, the restricted argument that I was making. The, the complication has to do with the, 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 the kind of instrumental logic that it, seems to, that it seems to imply. So there is something called the state and it has an instrument, the police, and it has another instrument, the educational apparatus, and the educational apparatus is used to, to, to hide and obfuscate the, the, um, the, course of, the, the course of ontology of the police. But that's not right. right? It's the, the, the state is not separate from its instruments. That separation between concept state and the institutions as instruments 
is a, a conceptual error um, that, that needs to be addressed. Um, in, the, in the version, in the alternative state version that I had in mind, that I call the Republic of Defective Institutions, uh, that would not arise because the institutions, defective institutions are precisely constituted as non-instrumentalizable um, devices, uh, which is a, a, a kind of paradoxical formulation since a device is an instrument. But anyway, that's that's the idea. Um, whereas in the 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 Westphalian state form, informed by uh, the, the conception of state, the conception of nation that you get from the early part of the 19th century, there is a, a kind of instrumental relation that is established between something called the state and something called the institutions that distribute the power of the state. And that, that needs to be uh, defeated. Who secures the right of freedom in the kind of republic of defective institutions that I had in mind. Um, there is no way to secure that. And the determining it as a right is, is, is part of what is at issue. Um, so I, I think that a follow-up paper and perhaps a follow-up conference that should consider the relation between sovereignty and right, right? The, the concept of right. Um, the right to freedom, uh, the right to, to forgiveness, I think, to go back to Professor, uh, I think it was Ishii's comment. Those are, it's difficult to conceive of them as rights without without employing a model of, of subjectivity that is precisely allied with the models of the classic state and the classic police state that I want to get away from, right? Um, so another way to frame this would be to say, what kind of rights can a subject conceived as I was conceiving it at the end of the paper in the different between the empirical and the transcendental subject, what kind of rights can that kind of subject possess? Um, can, and how can the claim to a right to freedom be imagined outside of classical bourgeois subjectivity? Right? So without answering the question, I wanted to, to rephrase it in such a way that you see how the direction that I'm going also requires us to reframe the concept of rights, and in particular, the right to freedom. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yes, Professor Hoshin. Hi, Jack. Um, thank you for your... How are you? Nice like, to see uh, you again. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, so my question is on the notion of defective institutions as well. Um, I, I totally agree with you. I like your idea of dismantling the police or state. Uh, so I, I share your vision on effective institutions. But my question is how to keep the institutions defective? Yes, so, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so like uh, many people like the strong, stable institutions. So uh, how to share the vision and how to keep such a defective institutions in the practical level, in yes. a sense. So this is, my, this is my question. Yes, thank you. That's, that's absolutely the question. And um, so one of, the, one of the questions that my paper that I just read tries to answer is, why do we desire institutions that are not defective? Um, th there's a way of answering that question that says, well, what I was calling rather quickly the classical institution is possessed of a kind of phallic authority. Um, it's reassuring in as much as I borrow from it, I, 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 rel I relinquish myself to the institution and I take back from it 
a position in a society and uh, a, an identity. I take a sense of continuity. I sense a sense of collective temporality. All of those things I, I get from the classic institution and I do not get those from the defective institution to the contrary. So in, in promoting the idea of a defective institution, I'm requiring us to abandon those things, right? Uh, continuity in time, uh, continuity in identity, um, a, 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 a fairly reliable conception of, of a phallic authority to which I can resign myself in order to get back a corresponding authority. All of those things have to be set aside. It, it would make a complete sense psychically, psychologically, that one could do that and say, oh no, that's horrible, and, and, and want to retreat to a conventional institution or a classical institution because the sense of exposure and of, of, of being bereft and of un, unmoored, you, you're, you, you're not tied down to anything, um, would seem to be devastating and terrifying. When you say you're not tied down to anything, that's exactly wrong for what I'm thinking. Of. So what I'm thinking is that a defective institution, and, and you'll, you'll, you'll hear the direction that my thinking here towards Balibar and towards um, um, Simondon and so on. What, what I think could be the outcome of defective institutions is a much strengthened concept of relation, right? Um, so rather than synonymy, which is on the, on the bad side, <laughs> right? It's on the side of the, of the constraining institution, um, putting in a concept of relation that is pre-identitary. So, so a, a relation before the relata, um, that, that is the, that would be the key thing. It's a very difficult position philosophically to articulate because the, the you, you seem to get into one of these um, recursive problems. Uh, how can you have relation without relata, without things to be related? What, does it, what, what would be entailed in making relation primary to substance? Uh, it's, it's philosophically an, an absolutely taxing question and not, 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 not something of easy solution. Psychologically, it's even worse in a way, right? Because it means that before you have a person to relate to, you have relation, you have drive. So it might be that you say that you're putting the primacy of the drives before the primacy of the object, right? And so, so the, 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 the brief answer is that the defective institution places relation before substance and works to place constantly works to place relation before substance and works to place uh, the drive before the object of the drive. Thank you. That's a very interesting idea. Thank you. Please. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, as we are approaching the end of today's workshop, I, I should have said something like one more question, uh, but I want to recognize <laughs> this right. And, uh, and uh, yes, and uh, to be defective. I want to ask one small question. <laughs> uh, like this, I'm so familiar with Jacques Lea. Um, you, you, your questions, they always begin with this. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right, right, right. It reminds, reminds me of the years at NYU, right? Right. I'm so familiar with your thoughts. So this is might be a repetition of my 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 idiotic questions I put forward before. But your your description of the your idea, or, or if not your ideal, namely the defective institute, yeah, yeah. Uh, is always following um, the grammar of negative theology. Like it is not it's not not continu uh, it's not continuous. It's it's not uh, affirmative. It is contingent. It is um, at random. It is not this, not that. So, can we say that your defective institution is parasite to uh, 
the, the normal institution. Namely, it is unimaginable. Yeah. We don't start with the current operative uh, powerful institution. Yeah, I think that's right. I, it's and it would be, it would be historically impossible. So defective institutions would be historically and conceptually impossible without existing strong institutions. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that, yes, there is a, a kind of insistence of a negative theological moment um, in the sense that it's very difficult to provide a positive definition right. of, of them. I think the closest I've come is answering Futoshi's um, uh, question. But even that is not, it's not really sufficient. Mm -hmm. My idea in writing the book was to, to, to provide something quite specific and to say, OK, so defective institutions, rather than a, a completely incomprehensible and very abstract philosophical program, um, here are some things we could do. So my idea is, is that really that we need to have um, the capacity to produce these defective mm. institutions. Um, and, and to run families like in this way, to run states this way, to run universities as defective institutions. I don't, I don't envision this as an entirely abstract and exercise. To the contrary, I think of it as a, as the, a device for producing actual change, institutional change. How we do that right. is tricky, but I'm, I'm convinced that it's possible. And the, this this book would be useless if it's just a kind of abstract meditation on this new concept of the defective institution. No, I want people in the streets with the book saying, okay, so let's transform this institution into the kind of institution that is defective in this way. Mm, 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 mm. All right, <laughs> it's, all right, it's another version of communist manifesto. And it's yeah. okay. Let's give some applause to Professor Jacques Lezra for thank you, thank you so much. Talk. It's we are running out of time, and I guess it's time for your dinner, right? It's it, 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 yeah. in the states. I, I hope that somebody has made dinner for me in the other part of the house. I, <laughs> <laughs> maybe a dog. I, maybe we're eating my dog. This is <laughs> a big possibility. <laughs> No, don't do that. That's 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 not defective enough. Anyhow, <laughs> thank you for uh, joining us, and uh, we hope that we could continue our discussion in the future. I, Chin, I have a question. Are you yeah. is are you going to make the recording of this available? To, uh, to good question, is... Professor Kokubun. Um, are we going to do that? You mean you want the recording? Well, it's partly that I want it for myself. I would very much like it, but I also have friends who would who express to me the desire to to hear it, but couldn't be here today. Right, I, right. So I was wondering if it was if it was if it would be available to them. I think that's completely possible. Thomas like sound it's okay, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 You're well on the of course. We, Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, we will find a platform to upload today's uh, talk uh, and make it public if if everything is okay. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody, so okay. much. I, it's been such a pleasure and such an honor, and I, I'm I'm extremely excited at this project. I think it's it's quite mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah, we will have uh, more symposium and conferences in future. And uh, absolutely, we hope that you can join us um, uh, in future as well. And uh, thank you. And thank you all for participating in today's workshop. And the